if you would take your Bibles and open with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, and my assignment today is to address the issue of masculinity, or you might say mature manhood, and abuse. Abuse. There is a massive crisis in our world today on the abuse of women. We see that outside of the church, some 600 women per day in America are sexually abused. And we see that inside the church, as you've seen in the recent press reports. And if anyone should speak out against it and should stand up for the dignity and value of women, it should be the church of Jesus Christ. And leading the charge in the church of Jesus Christ should be faithful, robust, biblical, masculine leaders. We typically call them men. So we're going to turn to the text of Scripture today. We're going to read in Ephesians 5, verses 25 down to the end of this chapter. So if you would follow along with me as I read aloud, this is the Word of the living God. And Paul writes these words to the church in the city of Ephesus. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Well, Father, at this very juncture, in this very conference, as we have the sacred scriptures open before us, as we think through the complexities of abuse and the calling for male headship and leadership both in the home and in the church, we pray that you would grant us wisdom to know exactly what that looks like and how we can do that, how we can follow your word with precision and yet with a courageous boldness that would look into the face of a perverse culture and not back down and not shrink back from the calling that you've placed upon us in this hour. Let us be faithful. Let us hold fast to your word. Let us refuse to capitulate. And may it all be done for your praise, honor, and glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Ted Bundy was executed in, a, in the electric chair on January 24th, 1989 in a Florida state prison. He had been convicted of raping and murdering 30 women and girls over seven states between 1974 and 1978. Bundy was a sociopath who found pleasure in the pain of women. He titled himself, quote, the most cold-hearted SOB you'll ever meet, end quote. So how did Bundy become what many believe to be the most cold-hearted serial killer in American history? Well, his story is striking because you see in his own words, he said that he grew up in a normal home. He grew up in what he calls a quote-unquote Christian home. And he had loving parents that sought to care for him and protect him from the evils in this world. And although he had many friends and interacted well with others, he said he wasn't looked at as someone that people could just sense there's something wrong with that guy. He said, I seem to be like a 
an average guy just rolling through life. He said, but there was this one thing that I hid from everyone. I kept it a secret. I had it very close to my heart. And I refused to tell anyone what it was. And what it was, was a profound addiction to pornography. Interestingly enough, before he was electrocuted in in, in his death sentence on January 24th, 1989, some time before that, he was granted an interview with James Dobson. And as he sat down with Dobson for this interview, which you can find on YouTube and you can watch the interview, Bundy says something very sobering. He says this, quote, he says, I'm not a social scientist and I haven't done a survey. He says, but I've lived in prison for a long time now. He says, I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit a lot of violence just like me. And he says, and without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography. Without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. That's true of America today. America is very much a pornographic culture. When you look around and you see the the problems in America, most and many of those problems, as it revolves around sexual misconduct, are very much connected to pornography. We've turned women into products to be consumed. We have turned human sexuality into a fluid playground to be enjoyed. And the result is a culture that promotes sexual freedom. The violation of women and the murder of children in their mother's wombs. How did we arrive at this present evil, broken culture, you say? Well, if you can go back with me and imagine the Garden of Eden. If you can go back to paradise and just imagine, if you will, the beauty. Imagine the scene in the Garden of Eden with every flower rising to the heavens without the slightest blemish. Imagine every bird soaring through the radiant sky above. Imagine the relationships between the created beings. Nature was at harmony with itself because it was at harmony with its Creator. Imagine the relationship between Adam and Eve, unbroken by sin and perversion, without the slightest imperfection physically, mentally, or spiritually. They enjoyed one another. They walked with one another. They walked with God. When Satan embodied the serpent in entered the garden, his attack was very calculated. He caused Eve to gaze upon what God had forbidden. He caused Eve to rethink God's Word, if you will. Satan attacked the very Word of God, casting a shadow upon the Word. He enticed Eve, and then Eve took the advice of the serpent who hated God. And with this very first sin, we see not only Rebellion against God, but we see rebellion against God's created order. The first sin was what we call the first role reversal. It's the very first time that we ever see the woman taking leadership over her husband. And this, my friends, is where everything went off track. It's where everything went wrong. This position that we call egalitarianism was birthed in this very scene. It wasn't birthed in the feminist movement. It wasn't birthed in the women's liberation movement. It wasn't birthed in in some modern Me Too movement. It was birthed in the Garden of Eden. Every perversion imaginable within human relationships comes out of this very first sin. In Genesis chapter number 3, we see that God pronounced a curse upon creation as a result of this very sin. There would be hardship, corruption, complication among relationships. In chapter 4 of Genesis, we see polygamy. In chapter 9, we see pornography. In chapter 16, we see adultery. Chapter 34, fornication. And on and on it goes. You see, Genesis starts off with the burst of life and light, but it, it ends with darkness and death. And yet, as we think about abuse in this broken world and injustice on our wives and 
sisters and mothers and little girls. This perversion was birthed in the Garden of Eden in sin. You see, it's not new, it's ancient, and it's not good, it's evil. Woe unto the man who calls evil good and good evil. It's not acceptable. And the church should stand up and say it's not acceptable. When we turn on the news or we open a newspaper and we see names of individuals who have been abused and we see individuals who are, have their faces plastered in newspapers as pastors of local churches who have been very much guilty of this abuse, it should strike us to the core. It should hurt us. We should think about what it would be to find out that one of those individuals is what was guilty of a crime against our own daughter or wife. We must view our sisters in Christ as daughters of God and treat them with respect and dignity and value that God, that God Himself designed from the beginning. We must make sure that the whole wide world knows that abuse and abuse of women, abuse against women by these men, that they're not just overly passionate complementarians. In fact, they're not complementarians at all. Such a man has forfeited his post, walked away from his post as protector and provider. And we must take that seriously. So, At this juncture, I think that it would be safe to say that within this controversy that's swirling within evangelical circles on the issues of complementarianism and egalitarianism and whatever might be in between, whatever other ism might be there in the middle, we can all agree on this issue, I think, as Christians we would say at least, that abuse against women is a bad thing and we must oppose it. But the issue is that at this juncture, now is where you're going to start to see a bit of a divide among brothers in the same camp. Now, how do we approach this abuse? And that's where we're going to start to see division. In other words, the methods that we employ. Is the answer social justice? Or is it the sufficient Word of God? Is it some sort of political maneuvering? Or is it the sacred Scripture that's enough? Now, think about, if you will, Ephesus. Paul writes this to a church in the city of Ephesus. It was a perverse city. It was a pornographic culture. Imagine, if you will, this this very city. It was so full of all sorts of of sin. But yet it it was a popular city for trade. It was a popular city for athletics, but it was also a popular city for worship. It was in this very city that you see you have the, the temple of Artemis. And At the center of this temple was this multi-breasted false goddess where men from Ephesus would go up into this temple and they would engage in idolatrous worship to this false goddess through temple prostitution. If there was ever a city that was abusive to women, it would have been Ephesus. And what we see is we see that the Apostle Paul writes this letter to a church in the midst of that very city, a city that was filled with abused women, a city that was filled with men who viewed women as objects to be used, wrote this letter to a church in a city that was a pornographic city. He wrote this letter to a church in a city that downgraded marriage covenants and viewed them as disposable. And likewise, as a result, women in this culture were disposable. And so, Paul didn't communicate to Timothy. He didn't communicate in 2 Timothy in his final letter as Timothy would pastor the very church in this city and say something like, well, you need to employ certain tactics from the culture, maybe political maneuvers, maybe intersectionality, or social justice. No, before his head was cut off in the streets of Rome, Paul writes this final letter to the very man who would pastor the church in this city and says, preach the word. He doesn't say ramble on about social justice or use intersectionality. He says, preach the word. So call me crazy, if you will. I think that if the Bible was sufficient for Ephesus, it's sufficient for America, and it's sufficient for the city in which you pastor. Pastor. 
I urge you, brothers, not to capitulate in the slightest degree on these issues. Don't back up. Don't shrink back. Don't throw in the white towel. Stand flat-footed without blushing upon the inerrant, the infallible, the authoritative, and the sufficient Word of the living God. In this text, we see really two things in the time perimeters that I have that I want to try to bring before us. First, we see the example of mature manhood in verses 25 through 27. And then in verses 28 down to verse 33, we see the call to biblical manhood. So who's the greatest example? Well, the greatest example of mature manhood is none other than Jesus Christ Himself. Notice what the text says in Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. That, here's the purpose, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. We see two, two areas, if you will, where Christ is the, the prime example of mature manhood. In His earthly ministry, Jesus provides for us this ultimate example, first in a physical realm, and then second of all, in the spiritual realm. In the physical realm, we see that these words should, should really pierce our soul when we, when we hear these words. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, as He loved His bride. This is the way that we should love our bride. This physical love is unbelievable. Romans 5, 8, but it says that even though we were sinners, even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. The Roman cross was no easy way out. It was, it was a harsh, painful way to die. Humiliating. It was the worst possible way to die. And it's the precise way that Christ died physically to save His bride from her sins. You see, crucifixion was, it was invented by the Persians. It was practiced by the Phoenicians and the Egyptians, but it was perfected by the Romans. And by the time that Jesus was nailed to the cross, some 30,000 others had died on a cross before He was nailed to His cross. So they had perfected the art of putting people to death on this, what they would call, the infamous stake. This was a horrific way to die. J.C. Ryle says the sufferings described in it talking about the crucifixion, would fill our minds with mingled horror and compassion if they had been inflicted on one who was only a man like ourselves. But when we reflect that the sufferer was the eternal Son of God, we are lost in wonder and amazement. Every movement upon the cross signaling pain, having to press upward to breathe to avoid suffocation, slashed flesh and open wounds, joints stretched almost out of joint, trying to gain a, another breath, naked body hanging shamefully before the people, parts of His beard ripped from His face, no ability to wipe the blood that was running into His eyes causing blurred vision. And as He looked to His left, a criminal. As He looked to His right, another criminal. As He looked downward, there were... There were soldiers playing games at the foot of the cross. It was a horrible scene. Mocked by the Jewish people. Mocked by the Jewish leaders. Mocked and reviled by the criminals. And Spurgeon said it became midnight at midday. Spurgeon went on to say, crucifixion was a death worthy to have been invented by devils. And this is how Christ in His physical Mature manhood cared for His bride. But not only physically. Notice, 
There's a spiritual element to this. Obviously, we know that he's dying to save sinners. But note what the text says. That, verse number 26, that he might sanctify her. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. You see, Jesus has a goal to sanctify his bride through the word of God. If anyone should ever be raised up as an example of someone who actually embraced the full sufficiency of Scripture, it should be Jesus. I mean, after all, he, he appealed to, to Jonah and believed in the literal account of Jonah and used it as an example of his own death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus said in Matthew 5.18 that heaven and earth would pass away before one piece of the full word or the law would pass pass away. It would all be fulfilled. Jesus said in John 10.35 that the Scriptures cannot be broken. And in His prayer to the Father in the high priestly prayer, Jesus said that the Word is truth. And so Jesus would sanctify His bride. The plan of sanctification for the bride of Christ is the Word of God. And so this is the prime example. Notice holiness is not an option here. But holiness is the goal that Jesus has for His bride. But then second of all, you'll see the calling to mature manhood. Undoubtedly in our day, manhood has fallen on hard times. Masculinity is something that's been turned into a pejorative, if you will. But notice the text here. If you look at verse number 28, you'll see this striking phrase, in the same way. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. That's what we're called to do. Years ago in ancient cultures, throughout human history, to be a man meant that you need to be able to build and farm and fight. In more modern times, it's been replaced. That formula has been with the three B's, the bedroom, the ball field, and the billfold. How does a man perform in the bedroom sexually? How does he perform in athletics on the ball field? And how does he perform in the professional world with his billfold, as an example? It's based on how you perform. Sadly, our world has a very shallow view of manhood. But have we forgotten what Vody Bauckham calls the Four P's that a man is to be, at least a Christian man, is to be a prophet. He's to be a priest. He's to be a provider and a protector. You see, and Jesus is the ultimate example of that. And that's why Paul says here in this text, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. You see, today the evangelical world is using this, this love your neighbor formula to promote social justice. But you see, social justice is a broken term. It's a broken method that flows out of a leftist political sewer. And it has nothing to do with biblical justice. However, as we study the imperative to love our neighbor, we need to remember that our closest neighbor is not the person who lives the next house over. But as Martin Luther said, the Christian is supposed to love his neighbor, and since his wife is the nearest neighbor... She should be His deepest love. So in the physical sphere, how do you do this? Well, the word love has become perhaps one of the most prostituted words in the English language. Yet John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And that's, of course, talking about Jesus and His love in the same way husbands are to love their wives as Jesus has loved His bride. And sadly, we hear the word or the phrase, I love pizza. Or we might see a, a statement, I love video games. Or you might be writing to the SBC and see a bumper sticker that says, I love Ford. Or you might see some sort of bumper sticker, not on my car, mind you. I love cats. Not my car, but maybe there is one out there that has that sort of bumper sticker, but you see how the word love is used. I love this, I love that, oh yeah, and I love my wife. And we sort of water down the, the very word love. 
But you see, 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. By the way, your prayers are going to be hindered if you don't learn how to live with your wife in an understanding way and love her and respect her as an image bearer and a joint heir with you, with Christ. You see, Christ and His love involves both physical, physical love, but also spiritual love. And we need to, in that same way, learn to love our wives. We need to protect our Wives. We need to protect our daughters. We need to protect women in the culture. As I've stated already, some 600 women every day are sexually assaulted in America, and that should not be right. That's why it is that Paul closed out his letter to the church at Corinth by writing these words. He said this, he said, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Why in the world would Paul have to say that to close out his letter to the church in the city of Corinth? Act like men. Apparently, there were men in the church not acting like men. And they needed to be exhorted to act like men. And so we need to make sure that we understand what that looks like. So if you hear a banging sound in the middle of the night, say 1 o'clock in the morning, this clanging sound in the basement, now it could be a paint can that your cat knocked off the shelf, and it banged on the floor. Or it could be someone that's an intruder coming in to harm your family. So what do you do? One o'clock in the morning, you're snoring, your wife says, I just heard something downstairs. It sounded like, and you're thinking, well, it could be the cat. But then in your mind, you're also thinking, well, it could be an intruder. So then what do you do? Honey, why don't you run on down and check it out and see what it is? No, that's that's not what you do. This is what Paul would say to you. He would say, act like men. Step out in front. Care for your wife. Cyrus, the ruler of Persia, one of his generals had been accused of treachery and condemned to die. And when her husband found out the news, he literally runs to the palace. He comes into the very room, sees his wife there in front of Cyrus. He sprints to to stand in front of her, throws his body down. And he says, Oh, my Lord Cyrus, take my life instead of hers. Let me die in her place. Cyrus was moved by this whole display and stated that he didn't see any reason that their love should be spoiled by death, so he sent them both away free. And as they went away, the husband said to his wife, said, did you notice how kindly the king looked at us when he gave you the pardon? And the wife replied, I had no eyes for the king. I saw only the man who was willing to die in my place. You see, that's not male chauvinism. That's not misogyny. That's not sexism. That's not macho male ego. No, that's what you call male headship put on display in the context of a marriage. But you see, not only physically, but also spiritually in the same way. So notice what it says in verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Now notice this, how how verse 30 begins. Because we are members of His body. We're members of of his body. We are members of the church. Therefore, we have this responsibility as men to care for our wives both physically and spiritually. Even an unbelieving man has this idea understood, written on his soul that he should protect his wife. But a believer, member of the household of faith, understands the spiritual sphere. In other words, it's Mature manhood, it's not how much you bench press. It's not how far you can run. It's not how many guns you own. It's not based on 
how well you do with mechanics or carpentry skills. You may hold a coral belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and be able to bench press 300 pounds and you may be able to climb a high mountain, skin a deer, and shoot class three weapons like a champion. But if you don't know how to care for your wife spiritually, then you're not a biblical, mature man. You can know a lot of things about manly things. and You can flex your muscle. But if you don't know how to properly lead your wife and provide for her spiritually and physically, then you have capitulated. James Montgomery Boyce said it this way, a holy person or saint is one who is set apart wholly for God. That is what Jesus desires of His church, that she might be set apart wholly for Himself. So also are husbands to love their wives. You see, how do we, how do, we do this? You say, well, it, it involves loving your wife through the Word of God. Just as Jesus' plan is to sanctify His bride through the very Word of God, we are to sanctify our brides through the very Word of God. In other words, we need to remember that the Word of God, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It is theonoustos. It is all breathed out by God. And so therefore, every aspect of the Word of truth is profitable. It is profitable. The totality of the Word of God is, is given to us for the profitability of God's church, which means you, your wife, your children, 1,189 chapters, 31,000 verses, 33,000 promises, and over 6,400 commands. The Scripture is the treasure of God for His people. John Calvin once said, where the Bible speaks, God speaks. And so male headship is more than just attending church on Sunday morning. It's more than just taking your wife to a Bible study. It's about family worship and prayer and countless other things. But what we must understand is that we are to be sanctifying our wives through the Word. See, in ancient days, the, the wife, before she would be married, she would be led down to the river and she would undergo this ceremony of cleansing at the river. And this idea of cleansing was the it was a ceremony to prepare her to have everything washed away from her former life and now to be joined fresh and anew to her groom, to her husband. And so this idea of washing, this idea that, that, that the church would be washed through the Word, that's the imagery that's been given here. And so we need men who know the difference between Sarah Young and Martha Peace. You just need to know the difference between the two. You need to know the difference between, say, a, a Don Piper and a John Piper. They're not actually the same guy. We need to care for our wives. You see, complementarianism in the home is important. Male headship in the home is God's ordained blueprint from the Garden of Eden. You see, we have, to, we have to grasp this. Brothers, you need to understand this. And, and everyone in this room needs to see that this is not something that's a post-fall issue. Male headship is not something that, that comes as a result of the fall. It comes to us as, a, as something that's rooted in creation. It's a part of God's blueprint from the beginning. Adam was created first. He was given the commands to lead and to have this headship responsibility. He was the one that was giving the names to all of the animals. He's demonstrating headship and responsibility and leadership in the garden. But you must understand something. That same model flows from the garden through our homes, through society, and into the church. The qualifications that we find in 1 Timothy 3 that David Miller preached on earlier they have masculine characteristics. Why, you say? Because it's rooted in creation. It's a part of God's blueprint from the beginning. And what we must understand is that it's not that those individuals who are elders in a church, that they're somehow the spiritual Navy SEALs and they're the, the elites of the church and they're the only ones that should look that way. You know, when you read 1 Timothy 3, you shouldn't say, man, that's what only the pastors look like. 
It should be an example of what every man in the church should actually look like. And then among that group, God would then choose certain men to be the shepherds to care for the church. But far too often today, we look at 1 Timothy and Titus 1 and those qualification passages and we see, oh, that's just for the, the spiritually elite. That's not so. That's the calling for biblical manhood. That's what we're called to do. Back in the conservative resurgence days, the liberals would use the same words with different definitions. They would say, I believe in inerrancy. I believe that the Bible contains the Word of God. And the Bible believer would say, I believe in inerrancy, but I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Contains versus is. Only one word that differentiates, but yet worlds apart. In our present culture, we have a similar debate going on with words. And by the way, words matter, doctrine matters, theology matters. And when you see people saying, well, I hold to complementarianism, I believe and I would never support a woman being ordained to the office of pastor. Well, that sounds really good. But the problem is, it's not exactly right. It's right, but it's only right to a point. You see, there is a distinction, what we might call soft complementarianism and Hard complementarianism. By the way, complementarian as a word is just a difficult word. I mean, couldn't we come up with a better word than that? And then soft complementarianism sounds like, well, that's the real nice guys over here. And then hard complementarianism, that's like the mean Calvinist over here. No, you know, not good. And you just get lost in the confusion. There's another position. I believe in complementarianism too. I don't believe that women should be ordained to the office of elder. And I also believe that the boundaries and the roles and the distinctions that God has placed for men and women in the church are good, which means that she should not teach or exercise authority over men, which is written right in 1 Timothy. We should believe that. We should not blush about that. But this progressive culture today has complementarianism directly in its sight. Mature, robust, biblical manhood has been in many ways just viewed as outdated and old-fashioned. And it's very unfortunate. Our culture today has turned patriarchy into a pagan sin. And it's turned male headship into misogyny. A rejection of male headship and a robust biblical patriarchy leads to a rejection of divine sovereignty and a new perspective on the biblical text. This idea of a kinder, more gentle complementarianism inches closer and closer to ancient pagan feminism. In a world filled with devilish injustice and abuse, the kindest and most protective thing that we could ever do for women is to actually believe the Word of God without qualification. This paganism was not birthed in the feminist movement of the 60s and 70s. It was birthed in the Garden of Eden. We must never forget it. You see, the first Adam lost paradise and led us away from God, but it is the last Adam who will one day come, and when He comes, He will make all things new. In Christ, paradise will be regained. There will be a new world with redeemed relationships where our wives and our mothers and our little girls and our sisters will be protected forever. Until then, our calling as men is to protect and to provide and to stand up against abuse and to believe in the dignity and value and the image-bearing picture that we see, not just in men, but also in women. As Paul said to the church in Corinth, we are to act like men. I would like to close by quoting Russell Moore in an address that he gave to the evangelical 
Theological Society on November 17th, 2005, where he said the following. He said, quote, Ironically, a more patriarchal complementarianism will resonate among a generation seeking stability and a family-fractured Western culture in ways that soft-bellied, big-tent complementarianism never can. And it will also address the needs of hurting women and children far better because it is rooted in the primary biblical means for protecting women and children, calling men to responsibility. Patriarchy, he says, is good for women, good for children, and good for families. End quote. And I say a hearty amen to that. We need Mature, biblical, robust, godly men who will not blush, who will act like men. So, my brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We thank You for this privilege to be together in this Founders event. We pray that You would bless this conference, bless each family that's represented here, the local churches that are represented here, and may the fruit come in due season. May You encourage us in the faith. May we stand firm on the sufficiency of Scripture without wavering. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.